Uh, let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Lord, once again, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy. We pray, Lord, that this message would be delivered and received in the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would help me to just get out of the way. We pray, Lord, we would understand what you want us to and that we would apply it to our life in a way that would honor you and bear fruit glorifying our Father in heaven. So thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So last time we left off with the disciples asking Jesus a question. They wanted to know which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They've been having this ongoing conflict. It started a while back, and it's going to continue into the future a bit. And we spent a lot of time talking about that last week. But in all fairness, if you or I were there, as one of the disciples, I tend to think we would be asking the same question. It's easy to look at them and go, can you believe these guys jockeying for position? But truth be told, if, if I was there, I'd be like, he is the Messiah. He knows me. He loves me. I, we're, we're friends. I'm actually friends with the Messiah. That means the kingdom is right around the corner. It, you know, with the expectation that they have, we're going to break off the, the, the yoke of Roman bondage and thy kingdom come as he taught us to pray a few chapters back. Man, and, and you know, so what is my role going to be? Peter, going to be my boss? <laughs> Do I have to be in the inner circle to have a position? I mean, you, I would be thinking these things. So, which one of us will be your right-hand man? And I'm sure what they wanted to hear was a name, preferably theirs. Mm -hmm. Essentially, they don't really understand what it is that they're asking. Because, interestingly, in a roundabout way, what they are asking is, on what basis does God evaluate people? And as we saw, that's the underlying question that Jesus addresses in his answer. The answer that Jesus gives us will show us that the disciples thought, as do most, they thought of greatness as being in terms of position, power, glory, rather than in terms of righteousness and humility. So, Jesus, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And instead of naming names and ranks, we read in verse 2, Then Jesus called the little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm sure that is not what the disciples were looking for. That's probably not what they wanted to hear. They knew in that day, children were not regarded as mighty or of high social status. Children were to be seen and not heard. They were just kids. A child was to be subject to authority, not the one in authority. You're telling me I have to be subject to rule? A child is one that has to be looked after, not one to be looked up to. And yet Jesus says that we must, and he made this imperative, we must take this kind of humble place just to enter the kingdom. Never mind being the greatest in the kingdom. Verse 4, we read, Therefore, whoever humbles himself in this, as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And when we realize the humble place that a child had in that culture, and when we begin to assume that role, then we're on our way to greatness. But that just isn't natural to us. That's not the way we go. Jesus said we must be converted to be like little children. It isn't our nature to fight for the low place. 
It isn't our nature to humble ourselves. And Jesus is teaching how we need to humble ourselves. And the word there, tapanoo, is, literally means to stay low. We need to be making ourselves lower than others, not higher. Not really what the disciples were seeking. We need to be honoring others, not ourselves. The greatest in the kingdom are those who humble themselves and esteem others to be greater than themselves. And then in verse 5, he said, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And that shows us what greatness in others looks like. And we spent a lot of time in these five verses. But this is where we're going to really pick it up. And we're going to cover a lot of ground. Verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Harsh words. I mean, that sounds extremely serious. The kind of thing that you and I should be paying attention to. Jesus takes it very serious when one of his little ones are led into sin. There will be a price to pay. Now, before we go on, it is important that we make a distinction here, that we understand something lest we not really understand the next few verses. Little ones does not only mean children. He's not just talking about the tykes, like the one he was holding in his hands or in his arms. But he said, but those who humble themselves like children, as Jesus described. He's talking about the ones that simply have simple faith and trust him and come to him. He's saying, you don't want to mess them up. You don't want to throw them off course. And for the next... Eight verses, we're going to be hearing about such a child and these little ones. This is the phraseology we'll be picking up. And to understand the next eight verses, it's absolutely essential that we keep the context in mind. Remember, context, context, context. Right? If you take the text out of the context, you can be left with a con. We need to understand what's being said before and after, and it fits in. Otherwise, we can pull out some, extract whatever we want. We can have a preconceived ideal we're trying to fortify. But context forces a balance. The context here is clear. He's not just talking about children. He said in verse 6, those who believe. And that's worthy of highlighting in your Bible because that makes the distinction. Jesus is going to be talking about those who have come to him in faith with humility, like children. So remember this. So as we read these next verses and see the word child and little one, remember he's talking about believers who come to him being converted, having become like a child, just taking him at his word. Now, what the Lord is saying is very, very serious. King James Version puts it this way. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And the term offend that he uses there literally means to throw off course. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you cause one of these that humbly believe in me and you cause them to doubt, if you're the one, if you cause them to, if you knock them off course, it would be better for you to be drowned. That's terrifying. I mean, that's, that's strong language. So, something that we need to just sit up and go, whoa, take notice. For there are many who disdain the simplicity of the gospel. Many add to it. Many complicate it with rules. Many complicate it with dogma. Many complicate it with tradition. And to do that would put you in a very dangerous place. I remember we took a youth group when I was a youth pastor to a concert. 
we, we, I used to run a school bus company, so I grabbed the bus, we packed the bus, we went all the way to Worcester, Mass, and we had this concert, it, it was great. And at the end, several of the kids, because they had invited their friends, several of their friends gave their life to Jesus at the concert. It was wonderful. And as we're getting on the bus, we're all praising the Lord. But I noticed there was a group of people behind the bus. And we went back there, and there were people from a, a, a church that, that were telling the people on our bus, you're not saved until you get baptized. That's what they were doing. They were literally like birds of the air plucking the seed. They said, oh, no, no, no. This is from the Boston Church of Christ. Oh, no, no, no. You know you're not saved until you've been baptized. It's like, wow. Complicating the simplicity of the gospel. Something that the Lord takes very, very seriously. Imagine the plight of a person who seeks to convince the immature believer that what God says is not okay is okay after all. I mean, that's what we see all around us. The Bible says this, everyone else, oh, no, no, that's, that's archaic. That's cultural. That's not applicable in your lives. It's like, man, we're all going to stand before the Lord. I don't want that on my record. Sin is wickedness, but it's far worse to lead others into sin. I cringe as I watch some of these people on TV, the way they fleece the flock with their heretical self-serving doctrine. You know, it's all about you gotta give to get. And they corrupt something. Leading anyone astray is a serious offense, but leading one of Jesus' little ones seems far worse. Because then what happens is you initiate someone into an instance or a pattern of sin, which ends up corrupting them. In other words, you don't want to be the reason somebody is spiritually jaded. You don't want your name on that list. Well, I was going to believe, but then I was watching fill in the blank and the way he lives, and I thought, hey, this probably isn't true. He says one thing, he lives another. No, church is full of hypocrites. No, it's not for me. Ooh, I don't want to be in that list. Anyone who causes a stumbling block for a believer a new believer, it, you know, this strong words. Better to be abruptly drowned than they'd be better off than instead of the judgment that God has in store. I mean, look, there's a lot of theological nuances and we can dissect it, but let's just be safe to say this is serious. He's talking about something very serious. I pity the college professors who use their intellectual superiority to shred the faith of young people with simple faith. What a dangerous place they are, professing to be wise. Now, in light of this, we need to be honest with ourselves. Do you think that the example you set for younger Christians is of no consequence? I mean, you know, we're all being examined. If you profess your faith, people are looking at you. Do you condone their sin by the way you tolerate it in your life? Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not being legalistic. I'm being, trying to be loving here. We need to take seriously how our disregard could cause someone else to stumble, right? I mean, it's clearly a very serious matter. And so when we become a little flippant in things, especially to those who are looking to us, looking up to us for direction, and we're like, ah, that's not a big deal, we need to be careful about that. When Christians use foul language around their children, they should expect them to the rise to the level that they're being taught. Some things are taught, some things are caught. Right? And when it comes to parenting, a lot more is caught than is taught sometimes. Right? When the parents don't care what their children watch, or when you or I said a poor example to new believers, it's not a small thing. We need to be mindful of it. Look at verse 7. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offenses come. So there's two woes here. And woe is bad. It's a bad thing. If you grew up in the 
70s, woe was like an endorsement from Fonzie. But here, this is a bad thing. He says, the first woe is kind of a lament. It's a cry. Woe to the world. It's kind of like this cry of pity for the fallen world. You know, just marinating in deception in, in the, this fallen system. And there's a lot of enticements. There's so many, you know, a lot of... It's, I don't think a lot of people understand. The, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The world just wants to suck you into the here and now and pull the loyalty of your devotion into things that are temporary as you're disregarding the, um, that which is eternal. Right? All you got to do is nothing to get sucked into the here and now. So, so woe to the world. I mean, a general lament because there's so much evil infiltration that are going to throw people off course. The second woe here, far more specific. This is the one we need to pay attention to. This is a warning to the one who brings or introduces other people to evil things. Woe to that man by whom the offense comes. So we live in a fallen world. It's inevitable that sin is going to hurt and that offenses are going to come. It's going to happen. That's all there is to it. Yet the person who brings that offense is guilty before God and doesn't have an excuse. And we need to pray that we don't become one of those people that just cause other people to stumble with our flippant, casual Christianity. God's going to take care of people who mess with these children. I'm not just talking physical abuse and things like that, but though anyone who makes a child, a, or a young child, or a child of God walk away from God. Mm -hmm. Somebody who finds that as a, you know, a, a, um, some intellectual checkmate to belittle someone of faith. Remember, to belittle is to belittle. And the truth of the matter is coming to faith is not a matter of an intellectual or not a matter of intellectual persuasion. But that's a discussion for another time. The world is full of stumbling blocks, things that make people fall into sin. It's, un, it's inevitable until Jesus comes back. We're always going to be surrounded by them. But just because the stumbling blocks are there doesn't mean we have to be them. So how can I be a stumbling block? To another believer, well, just do anything that trips them up with their walk with God. That's why if you want a position, if you want, as you, as you rise in, in, in any um, authority or persuasion, in, in sphere of influence increases, we need to understand that the way up is down. You, all of us, as you... As your sphere of influence grows, your rights should diminish. They should get smaller and smaller because you're putting other people first. Instead of standing there saying, hey, I can do this, the Bible, all things are lawful. And it's like, no. The more the influence grows, the more you're caring about the people around you. The more you don't want to put a stumbling block. The more you surrender things. Oh, it might be legally right, but it might not be morally right. You don't want to cause people to stumble. When we instruct somebody with a corrupted truth, we're causing them to stumble. When we, when we counsel them in an ungodly way, when we work to convince them that our sin isn't really a big deal, that's dangerous. When we exercise our freedom in Christ in front of a person who is of weaker faith. Do you understand what I mean by that? We should be operating under the law of love, putting others first. We cause people to stumble if we don't. When our foul mouth betrays our heart, when we're envious of other people, when we're prideful, when we're haughty, they see that when we're setting up idols, when we're the reason that someone falls into sin. It's just, there's a price to pay. And we need to be, you know, it's like, Lord, help me to be mindful of this. Because so often, so many people just go through life oblivious to the wake behind them. They just keep moving forward and don't see. 
This also tells us that God promises to deal with those by whom the offenses come. And that tells us a couple of things. Number one, don't worry about vengeance. Right? Just let God do what he does. In fact, you're better off learn, just learning to forgive. If anything, this teaches us that we can let go of the anger, let go of the bitterness for what people have done against us. You know why? God is on it. He's on it. I find that when I make a correction, when I decide to set the record straight, I tend to manhandle. I tend to turn, just add a little too much of whatever it is of myself. I've learned to let God be God. Let him. Let him be the one who vindicates. Crazy things are going to happen in your life, especially if you're a Christian. The accuser of the brethren is going to throw all kinds of things at you, and you're going to want to defend yourself. Let God do it. He's on it. I know his timetable doesn't match yours. We want instant vindication. We have this compulsion. Well, now that I'm up here, let me set the record straight about a few things that have been said about me. Let God take care of it. It's hard because you've got to die to self. But God is on it. And he can do a better job than you can. The point, though, here, don't be the cause of offense. Don't be the cause. In fact, in, in light of the judgment awaiting those who cause other people to sin, it's very much worth it to sacrifice some things in our battle against sin. <laughs> Look at these next verses. Verse 8. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands, two feet, and be cast into everlasting fire. Whew. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into hell fire. Now, Remember the first time you read that verse? Now, some of you might be hearing it for the first time, and I know the feeling. I remember. But you remember the first time you were like, whoo, man, what is he saying? Questions often arise on this verse. Should this verse be taken literally? For many people have. There are accounts, and you can read it, where people stole something and said, well, and, and I'll lop off my hand. But let's be blunt. I mean, real blunt. If we cut off body parts that we sin with, <laughs> yeah, there would be a lot of blinded people. There would be a lot of castrated people. There would be a lot of people who could never speak again because their tongue would have to be removed. But interestingly enough, the problem with taking these words as literal instructions is that it doesn't go far enough. In other words, taking them as literal instructions instead of conveying the attitude about getting serious with sin, think this through. If I cut off my right hand, I can still sin with my left, right? And then, so if I cut that, I don't know how I'm going to cast it. Right? If my left eye is gouged out, my right eye can still sin. And if all such members are gone, you know what? I can still sin with my heart. I can still sin with my mind. How do I cut that out? God isn't calling for bodily mutilation here. He's actually calling for a transformation that goes Beyond that, we need to be transformed from the inside out. Because my hand, my foot, and my eye, they are not the source of temptation. They're the means I use. So let's go back to the issue at hand. The issue is not causing other people to stumble. Rather than mutilating yourself by lopping off your hand, say, ask yourself, what am I doing? Is this wrong? And if so, that needs to be cut out of my life. That, this is such a radical, severe issue. It needs to be taken away. 
rather than lopping off your feet and defeating yourself, ask yourself, where am I going? Where is this going? What am I doing? Maybe I need to not go in these places. Maybe I just shouldn't be there. Maybe I should eliminate that from my life because it's messing me and other people up. Maybe I need to be honest about the choices I make, the things that I do, the places I go, what I spend my money on, what I'm entertained by. Maybe there are things that literally need to be cut out of my life if I want to not influence others in a bad way. Rather than gouging your eye out, ask yourself, is it really worth the price of looking at this? You see, we are not called to be spiritual pacifists. If you're stumbling in an area, or even worse, causing someone else to stumble, then you need to deal with it. That's the issue at hand. Many Christian adults are teaching their children, hey, whatever you want to do, you live any way you want, that's perfectly acceptable. It's time to wake up. Many parents are teaching their kids by example that it's okay to be entertained by the demonic. It's okay to, be, to, to spend your pastime just absorbing the very sins that crucified our Savior. Just downplaying it. Many Christians abuse liberties in areas like drinking or vulgarity or self-promotion or other things and we're oblivious to the wake of our careless cruising through life. Is there something that needs to be cut out of your life because there's a higher price to pay? And making believe that there isn't only makes it worse for you but it makes it easy for you to make others, especially those less seasoned, sin. Verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. There's an interesting verse. Their angels, this is where one of the main verses where people get the idea of a guardian angel. Because this verse kind of seems to indicate that these young ones, they have angels that watch over them and who report directly to God in heaven. God will ultimately take care, ultimately take care of those who harm his children. Because God's mind, God's eye are always on the little ones. We do well to treat them with love and respect. God protects the humble. To despise these little ones shows that a person has completely whiffed, completely missed the concept of true greatness in the context of the question asked. It's also to part company with God the Father to whom everyone is important, especially the least of these. You see, who's the greatest? Now, back to the whole guardian angel thing. We certainly do have angels uh, uh, watching over us, ministering to us. Uh, Hebrews uh, 1.14, and there's a couple other verses in, uh, in Psalms and things like that. Um, and it might not even have to limit it to a single angel. There's a lot of things we just don't know. And angelology is a fascinating study. And there's some great books on it. And there's some terrible books on it. Make sure that it's a rooted bibliocentrically and not experientially. Because if you go experientially, you've got the demonic realm that's there to pull you all different directions while tantalizing your intellect, making you think you're smart. We also see angels in Daniel chapter 10 and Daniel chapter 12 spoken of as representatives of nations, and that's kind of interesting. But here we have individual ones that have their heavenly representative. So just fascinating stuff. And so tempted to just jump off there, but moving forward. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. This is one of my favorite verses. You know why? That's the purpose of His coming. 
Right? We're going to be celebrating Christmas. Right? This is the bottom line. Why did he come? Right? Not just to be a good teacher, not to be an influencer, not to be the paragon of virtue. He's all of these. But he came to seek and save that which is lost. We don't want to be contributing in any way to their being lost. We don't want our conduct or any of that. As a disciple of Jesus, we need to share his heart and his care for individuals. Something we can only do if we're animated by the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you're just going to try to do well in your own strength. And I don't know, I think most of us have been a gerbil on that wheel and exhausted ourselves trying to do that. Oh, we need, we need to find a source of strength greater than ourselves. Now, children are easily lost, easily disoriented, and easy to mislead. So are young ones in the faith, right? Jesus has come to seek and save. Verse 12, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains seeking the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. What's the point? Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. I wonder if he's still holding a child at this point. And he's gone from non-offending children to misleading them to saving the lost and how important it is to God that the lost ones are saved. And he draws an example that, from real life that they can relate to. You know, as God cares for each of the little sheep, so should we. And this simple narrative demonstrates the value that God places on individuals. I think that's a beautiful truth that's often overlooked. Jesus exhorts us to reflect the same care. It's not about self. Who's, which one of us is the greatest? The one who cares the most about the least of these. Now, let's look at the other side of the coin. How do we take this approach and deal in the kingdom, in the family, with the people who are sinning against us? Messing us up, causing us to stumble a little bit. That's a real issue. So how are we to deal with it? Jesus, well, he explains it here. And I see a lot of times Christians are guilty of handling it their own way. I've done it my own way. Look, there's a way that seems right. But the end thereof is death. It causes separation. And I see a lot of pain because people do it their way. So here's the process of confronting a sinful believer. A believer that's going astray. A believer that's going to cause harm to others. He gives us a three-step program. On confronting the believer who sins. Moreover, verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Now, this starts off with the word moreover. It's actually in the Greek, it says D, which is a conjunctive. In other words, it means we connect it to the previous section. We don't, this isn't, you know, you look in, in many of your Bibles, you have a chapter break, and then it says church discipline, right? No, 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 Let's, this, this keeps, we got to keep the flow here, as Jesus is doing it. Right? This, we usually look at this section, it's usually taught as a template to what to do with Christians who aren't talking with, or aren't walking with the Lord, how do we get them out of the church? Church discipline. This is a process that we execute. But in reality, it's connected with the previous section of going after the lost sheep. It's actually, it's, we got to tie that together. How do we deal with the lost sheep, the one that's going astray? He's telling us. The shepherd goes after the lost sheep, a brother goes after his backslidden brother. The point of the passage isn't so much how do we properly punish a brother who's in sin, but it's about how to bring them back. That's the goal. The objective is restoration. And I think a lot of people look at this passage as how do we get them out of the people I don't like? 
How am I going to get them out of the church? And isn't there a problem? Yeah, there is this process. It's, that's not what this is about. The goal is not to justify separating from people. The goal is to bring people back to the Lord. It's easy to look at this passage and think that our attitude must be one of stern looks. You're in sin. You know, uh, harsh words. We need to rebuke people. You know, tisk tisk and shame, shame. Now look at what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So notice, spirit of gentleness. We need to be careful and realize that you too could just as easily fall into sin. We're no different than the other person is. You've got your own weakest links. You've got your own things that may be satanically exploited between your ears that no one else knows about. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, step one, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. So go to the offending brother first, on the down low. Not grumbling, not gossiping to others, right? Because that's what we want to do. You've offended me. I want to make sure everybody understands what you did wrong. I want my side validated. And Christians are notorious for doing it, except we do it spiritually. I have a prayer request. Can you help Bob to repent? You know, we need to pray for Bob. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we, 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 I've seen it. We're, we pray our brothers in the back. That's not the way we're supposed to do that. Right? Or seeking counsel. Perhaps you can tell me how to deal with Bob. <laughs> no, speak to the party directly. That's what you do. It says, if he hears you, you've gained your brother. Which is great, because it's actually, you, you gain him in a couple of ways. First, the problem's cleared up, right? That's wonderful. Perhaps you realize that, hey, in some ways he had a good point. He was actually right on some things that I didn't realize. And, and so, but either way, the, the problem's resolved. And that's, that's what we want. Second, and this is the one that is often missed, but we keep it in context. You've gained them because you have not wronged your brother by going to others with the gossip and half of a side of a dispute. See, we're not to ignore the fault of another disciple. We're rather to comfort them in love, in hope that they will repent. I'm not to go to someone else. Why? I'm going to cause them to stumble. A, I'm doing it wrong. And B, I'm getting them to side with me on an issue that they don't know the story. I'm corrupting their mind that way. Proverbs 17.9 says, He who covers a transgression seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates friends. God has a lot to say about those who cause division in the body. It's between you and him alone. It's a concern of no one else. It's a private confrontation. Even if, it, even if it, it's an open sin, even if it's a public thing or a serious thing, take him to the side. We want to convince him of his sin. That's what the scriptures say. I will also add this. Don't do it if you're the kind of person that enjoys doing that. You know what I mean? Some people pride themselves on setting others straight. Yeah. Another thing I tell you is, if you are going to do this, prepare to be misunderstood. Because they will act, we have a tendency to be brilliant in our defense mechanisms. Sometimes not so brilliant. Sometimes it's like, you know what, I'm just going to shoot the messenger. And that's what people do often. Prepare for that. The issue is you speak the truth and you speak it in love. The objective is to restore your brother. Step two, if you will not hear it, take with you one or more, I'm sorry, one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. See, the circle of people in the situation only becomes wider if... The party, the person in question refuses to listen. 
No need to bring everybody in, but if he refuses to listen, then you go and you get someone else, a witness. If he does not listen to you or two people, because that helps check out the validity of the accusation. Sometimes somebody will come to me with something, and as they're explaining it, I can ask them a question and go, oh, I didn't even realize that. Problem solved. <coughs> If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So if, he's, if the stubborn, unrepentant attitude remains, then they are refused fellowship. Even so, the unrepentant one should be treated with love and you know, with the goal of bringing about full repentance. And this is why. This is the whole reason behind this. It goes back to the context of the conversation. We can't allow the unrepentant one, we can't allow the leaven in the church to cause little ones to stumble. That's why. That's the reason. Here's the truth. Tolerance left unchecked kills. Pure tolerance will always embrace the means of its own demise. Imagine if I have a toddler and, you know, the church has grown and we've got a daycare or, or child care going on and a bunch of... And my toddler comes in and he's a wonderful kid. He's been, not been feeling well because he's got bacterial meningitis. But, you know, we don't want him to make him feel excluded. And so, oh, I don't want to be excluded. We're a tolerant church. Bring him into child care. Right? That's not a good shepherd, is it? So it may not seem nice to the child or to what we'll do it in love, but no, I'm not going to have everyone else contaminated, infected, because of our not willing to do anything at all. I think if I did that, you would have a right to be upset with me. So when someone comes in here who professes to be a believer and we all know that he's cheating on his wife, should I just tell the little ones, hey, it's, it's okay. Remember, the goal is restoration of the sinner. The goal is protecting the little ones. A healthy body will purge itself of poison and this is how the body of Christ is called to do this. The sense of being refused the full standing and participation of the body of Christ is what Paul means when he refers to delivering such a person to Satan. You see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. It, uh, there's a sense where the unrepentant person is chastened by being outside of the protection of the fellowship. And that's something we'll deal with soon enough. But let's close this out. And this was longer than I had anticipated. Let's close this out with a series of questions and then one brief illustration. So, who is the greatest? The one whose goal isn't greatness. Right? Not self-promotion, but promoting Jesus. Why do we need to be converted as children? Because humility is not natural. It's humiliating. And we see that as a negative thing. We want to be great. Jesus wants us to be great. Only we need clarification of terms. What Jesus calls greatness doesn't line up with our perspective. Next question. Do you have time for the little ones? Whatever that means to you. Or is it about you and your goal? However noble. The nature of Jesus sees each one. The nature of Jesus longs to engage. And even if, well, woe to the world and to those who introduce evil to the little ones. Have you or are you leading any little ones astray? When you're condoning sin, look out. Look out. God promised to deal with those by whom the offenses come. Look, if, if you want to provoke a man to anger, pick on his children, right? Woe to the man who causes God's children to stumble. Don't worry about vengeance. When you've been the one wronged, just learn to forgive. We see that if we're li really living in Christ, no other person can wreck our life. 
If they bring offense in our life, God's going to deal with them and not forsake us. It's just the way it's going to be. Next question. What do you need to cut out of your life? What are you doing? What are you going to? What are you watching? Please, please take it seriously because God clearly does. Give him the veto power in your life and say, Lord, show me what needs to go. Show me the correction that needs to happen. Show me where I'm setting a time bomb that's gonna detonate the future, in the future, hurting myself and other people. Give me the opportunity to make the correction now. Whatever it costs to eliminate it is a small price to pay in avoiding eternal damage and harm in other people. If Jesus would leave the 99 to save one astray, then how is it that we are okay with the very enticements that lead them astray? We need to cut that out. And when someone else sins or is in sin, don't be self-righteous in your approach. Here's my question, my fa final question. How would you want me to approach you? If Be what you need. We all fall down, we all sin. Be what you need. Be that person you would need if you were the one in, in that bad situation. Correct people, but do it in love, in the spirit of gentleness. We need to be genuine. We need to be humble and let God do what he does. I'm not trying to put law, goals above you, you know, that you can't reach. I'm not trying to put a carrot on a stick where you can't get it to make you to move. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I am trying to tell you that God can have you do live this way. He's not going to call you to do something. He won't empower you to do. But we need to be animated by the power of His Spirit. That's how it happens. I used to be a, a foster dad. I had a couple of kids. They had a really, really difficult situation. Or not foster, I'm sorry. The big brother type program I used to take. The, and there were these two boys and they really had a very bad situation. And anyhow, I would take them out and just love on them, share, them the, share the love of God. They had no, no male role model. And I remember I took them and I was bringing them up to the Quabbin Reservoir in Massachusetts. And, um, and uh, their neighbor, there was this little girl named Cassie, and the mom stepped out. And I was like, I know her from high school. This is your daughter. And she's like, yeah, she's best friends with these boys. Can she go with you? I'm like, sure, sure. So I, I had these two boys and I had Cassie. And I went and bought one of those 99 cent kites Remember the one with the big bloodshot eyes, that plastic cheap kite? We went to the Quabbin, and we were gonna have a picnic at the base of this huge dike, Goodnow Dike. It's, it's, it's this huge uh, wall of grass. And we're down at the bottom, and this group of college kids comes next to us, and they're setting up a, uh, uh, like I don't, I guess you can spend a lot of money on kites. Like they had this like super, they, they had a spool that they staked into the ground. I mean, these guys were serious. And they had this big thing they assembled. And then I'm like, you ready, Cassie? And I, I'm holding the, you know, that back bar. I say, when I say go, you run. One, two, three, run. And she runs. And I let go of the bar and the kite goes right up into the air. And it's flying, and, and I'm like, let the line out. Let the, as soon as it clears the top of the dike, the wind catches it. Beautiful, she's got it. Meanwhile, these guys, he's spending 20 minutes trying to get this thing off the ground. And there's this little girl with her 99 cent kite just having the time of her life. These guys are getting frustrated. We even tied it to our toe, to my toe, while we were, or my foot, while we were eating. We were having our picnic, we were just flying a kite and having our picnic. And it wasn't even multitasking. Meanwhile, these guys, they, they, they gave up. They couldn't get it in the air. And the point is this. You can try to do these things that you're reading about and try to be a better Christian and try to be more humble and try, try, try. Or you can let the power of the Holy Spirit do the work in your life. Like this, like little Cassie, the little, the just lifted that thing up to great heights. It's not a matter of getting the right equipment. 
It's not a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of letting God be the strength of your life. He can empower you to live a life that you can't live under your own strength. No one has deceived you as much as you've deceived yourself. But you can trust God. He's not gonna call you to live away. He won't empower you to live. Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this challenging passage of scripture. But Lord, we thank you for your love and for the gospel that saves us, that you died for our sins, that you paid the price that a just God demands, that you can look at us and see the righteousness. Lord, that you would give us the gift of righteousness. And it's a gift, we don't deserve it, but you so love that you gave. And we are just so privileged that you revealed yourself to us. And Lord, we ask you, fill us with your spirit. Not so we can jump high, but so we can walk straight. So we can live a fruit-bearing life animated by a source of strength so much greater than ourselves. For you created us for a purpose. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.